suffering from all sorts of other technical difficulties. Is it finally fucking? Is it working? Is it working? Okay, we have liftoff. We have liftoff. Hello, welcome to another episode of the Ranger Gareth podcast. It wouldn't be a Ranger Gareth podcast if we were not plagued by technological difficulties. I am joined by a co host, finally, for a day. I should have asked what you want me to call you today. In- introduce yourself. <laughs> Hello, my name is Matthew Kraska. I've known Gareth for a number of years now. Oh, I probably shouldn't use your real name, should I? Yeah, yeah, it's the Ranger Gareth podcast. Oh, okay. I, I haven't told anyone my my eight middle names. Well, I mean, that's okay. I can't remember your last name, let alone, let alone pronounce it properly. So I'm pretty sure that won't be an issue either. So Yeah, yeah, it's, it's tricky. Not a lot of Spanish people in Alberta. Like... Around the world, yeah, but like a couple, a couple of rivers and mountain ranges in between here and South America, so not a lot come up here. It's too cold. Mm, I don't know, man. This year, I'd say it's probably been pretty mild. Fact being, it was what January after to get our first like snowfall that stuck around for a couple days. Yeah, weird winter. Yeah. Second brown Christmas that I can remember in Alberta. Like, I think there was one in the late 90s, early 2000s, and then... Well, I mean, El Nino was around this year, from what they're saying. That, that's Spanish, isn't it? Yeah. I, hey! <laughs> I've got company. Uh, so, yeah, we're just going to go through a couple of the um, most interesting headlines I've come across, mainly focusing the Edmonton and Alberta area, but we've got a couple of good ones from around Canada, too, so... Uh, first one was what low water levels in Edmonton could mean for fish this winter. Multiple bodies of water are under water shortage advisories. As of November 23rd, the Clearwater River, Sturgeon River, and White Mud and Black Mud Creeks have water shortage advisories. These are imposed when stream flows or lake or reservoir levels are lower than normal, which can lead to reduced oxygen levels even before ice up, which can then lead to winter kill because there's not enough oxygen in the water. Now, for anyone that fishes in Alberta, we are very familiar with winter kill because we have so few fishable lakes that every single lake that dies off becomes at least provincial level news. Yeah, I mean, it's something that definitely we see more of than we would like. Uh, It's especially shameful when we have some couple real nice trout lakes that hold trophy class lakes, or sorry, trophy class fish couple hours outside of Edmonton uh, there was one that winter killed last year and which one was that Obed Obed oh right yeah the yeah. Cause that was good for brown trout and and perch uh Dink, had, dinky perch dinky perch but like near 20 pound browns hanging out Jeez. there um personally haven't put one on the end of a rod been out a couple times with people who have and uh they're a good fight. They're basically almost the size of the salmon that I pulled out of BC in the fall. So yeah, it was a real sad day when I heard about that one, and uh, I've had a couple people confirm it. So I've tried fishing Obed three times: once in the summer, twice in the winter. Never had any luck before the winter kill. Never even saw one of the Browns on camera. So I don't. I don't even know if they were doing good two or three years ago. They were, because that would have been about the last time I was out. Uh, basically, there was one, one we were out, you're just basically drifting along the top of the water, beautiful, crystal clear day, and you could see some of the monsters just lurking down on the bottom of the channel, and you could literally drop, like, a lure and bounce it off them, <laughs> and they wouldn't move, they didn't care. Um, there were a couple clouds of like uh, krill and like freshwater shrimp that we came across. That's all there. I came and, across when I was there. Yeah, so they they were very well fed and uh, explains the size of them. And it's just it 
they weren't interested. They weren't touching anything. <sighs> yeah, I guess I can blame that on user error, not catching yeah. any fish that yeah. time. Um, as for low water levels affecting oxygen, though, I mean, uh, it's definitely something we needed to pay attention to. I know, what was it, last year, two years ago now, especially out in the foothills, we have the warm weather advisories where if it gets... Yeah. Uh, too hot they actually shut down certain fisheries and uh, the mountain areas and the streams just to try to help the fish survive i remember bow river they introduced the time of day angling advi uh, angling restrictions yeah you couldn't fish between like noon and 8 p.m or something yeah um and that comes into effect i think once like the average water temperature hits a certain range i yeah. forget the exact details on it i know it came into effect uh, for sure this past summer. Um, another thing of note, even the Bow River that runs through Calgary, um, lowest recorded water levels in the river in the last hundred years this past year. So uh, talking to a lot of the guys I know that fly fish out in that area, um, a lot of shallow pools, like um, fishing was good early season and then once everything started to warm up, uh, they noticed a real big difference. Uh, fish weren't taking nearly as much. And yeah. Also, basically, fish took a lot longer to recover when they were going to release. So. Yeah, I have you seen the pictures of the St. Mary Reservoir and the Old Man Reservoir this winter? There, I saw some pictures floating around somewhere of one, and it's like the reservoir is pretty much empty. And it was, there was a lot of concern on it and because it was also the primary water supply that a lot of the local farmers and everything use. And they're being told that they might be getting uh, shut down from me being able to pull from it because if the reservoir gets too low, they won't even be able to supply like drinking water. Yeah, I, um, I'm going to add the photos to the notes, but... Just looking at the old man reservoir photos right now, like you, you've seen the old man when it was full, right? Yeah. Look, this is this is unreal. Like it looks like a moonscape. This it's just mud and sand. It's all desiccated. Like that that whole channel is just yeah. If if I hadn't been down there in the summer and already seen how low it was, I wouldn't believe this photo. This is unreal. So the old man's really bad. And then I think I also saw photos from the St. Mary Reservoir, which showed something similar. It was, um, it wasn't very good. Let's see what these are. Oh, that's also a picture from old man. Here is St. Mary's Reservoir. And again, that's, that should all be water right there. Yeah, the spill, like for the launch and stuff like that, yeah. Yeah, it's just a flat mud plain. I think like it was the St. Mary's one I saw. It was during the summer, though, that the photos they had. Yeah, so things are things are not looking great. Uh, yeah, November, like, the whole winter's been warmer and drier than average. El Nino's kind of messed things up. Like, we've had El Nino's in the past, though. Like, I'm, I'm not old enough to remember very much, but... Have we ever had a year that was this dry within our lifetimes? I mean, there have definitely been... We've had drought years. Yeah. Um, I know, like, thinking back, and, you know, not that I'm that much older than you, like, I remember as a kid growing up in Ontario, like, rural Ontario, you know, having this time of the year four feet of snow on the ground. Yeah. And, like, this is southeastern Ontario, Oh, like, uh, right by the St. Lawrence River, like, it was, you know, and then growing up, like, those snow levels just didn't come around as much anymore. Yeah. And, like, since I've been in Alberta, I mean, like, we've had a couple, I'll call them brown winters, where, like, there was no snow on the ground until, you know, Christmas or so that stuck. But, I mean, like, typically you would see, like, flurries, mm -hmm. like, we'd get snow, it would warm up, it would melt, and there would be that cycle of it. 
Whereas what early November we saw a bit of snow. Yeah. Oh, and then it melted. Yep. And then it was well, shit. What a couple of days ago that we finally saw some more. Yeah, I think I I think I read somewhere that November had virtually no precipitation. Yes. Which is unreal. Uh, another thing with low water levels that I didn't think about, but I saw when I read the article, um, it would increase the concentration of chemicals in the water body. Because the chemicals don't evaporate. That is correct. Yeah. So every animal that's living in the water, all the plants, they would just be experiencing those impacts so yeah. much more directly. Yeah, very true. So as you said, basically all the toxins and everything like that, anything that's water soluble, concentration levels are just going to rise. Yeah. I mean, uh, so that causes a whole other slew of problems. And we could get into, you know... Uh, whole bunch of other topics on that off topic very much so about you know open pit mining in the mountains and stuff like that but uh we, we <laughs> I, won't, won't touch up I, I don't have to say which particular mine in which particular river which goes down to montana where they've done selenium testing but a lot and, of us are familiar with it yeah yeah it's uh so that is definitely something that would you know increase oh did you Sorry, complete off topic. No, kind of topic with that. Um, did you hear that the new uh, water wells that were dug for uh, that specific town out in BC that a certain mine industry uh, had originally destroyed their uh, town's original drinking water supply with? Um, the new wells have a toxic level of selenium. Ah, shit. so uh, they're back to the uh, drawing board with that one. Have they been trucking in water? I'm not entirely sure how that's been going up that way. Um, I haven't been keeping too up and up with it yeah. um, in the last, well, probably two years. I mean, uh, having a kid has kind of uh, slowed down how much I uh, get out, how much I pay attention to some things. It was just a article I saw and I read and I didn't dig you know, too too much into it but I yeah. mean uh, if there is truth in that one I mean uh, womp womp I'm, a, I'm taking a herpetology course right now and we, ac we actually just went through the section on environmental toxicology and how different chemicals in the water do affect uh, sex reversal and amphibians mm -hmm. Alex Jones was right they're putting chemicals in the water that are turning the friggin frogs gay <laughs> <laughs> uh, put another quarter in the Papa Jonesy was right jar. Uh, another headline that caught my attention. Sea kayakers who paddled Northwest Passage charged with parks related offenses in Nunavut. Alleged offenses took place last summer in a national park and bird sanctuary. So what happened was a group of four sea, uh, sea kayakers are facing a long list of charges under the Canada National Parks Act and the Migratory Birds Convention Act for incidents that took place at, I believe this is pronounced, Bilot Island Migratory Bird Sanctuary and Sermilic National Park. A Parks Canada spokesperson wrote to, in an email to CBC that visitors are encouraged to plan ahead before visiting a national park in Canada and should be aware of relevant rules and laws before entering one of these sites. Now, I took a screenshot of all the charges because the list was so long. So they are being charged with using public lands in a park contrary to the Canada National Parks Act, possessing a firearm in a park contrary to National Parks wildlife regulations, disturbing wildlife in a park, unlawfully, en unlawfully entering a park without registering as required, unlawfully entering a restricted area in a park, and camping on public land in a park contrary to National Parks camping regulations. They were also charged with possessing a firearm in a migratory bird sanctuary. Now, that's a hell of a lot of charges. I don't know how I totally feel about this one because on the one hand, I do understand the need to respect the land, take care of the land. I understand national parks have certain rules and stuff. On the other hand, they did a really cool thing. They kayaked the Northwest Passage. And yes, did they camp on land that is park land? Yes. Is it parkland that is really used? No, except by, I guess, the animals and for the preservation of the wildlife. 
I just, I wonder how much damage they actually did by just paddling through and camping there. Um, I mean, I guess we'll never know the extent of the damage. I mean, I have, as you said yourself, very mixed feelings on it. I think it's super cool what they did. Um, did they follow the prescribed process of what they needed to do to be able to do what they did? Doesn't sound like it. Yeah. Um, on a complete side note, small personal story, kind of similar, but you know, not. Um, going through the Columbia and Icefield Parkways late at night, I um, was trying to make my way from Jasper to our campsite. I uh, ended up getting there late. They gave away our campsite and making our way down the highway trying to find an open campsite. And, uh, for my partner and I, I mean, we were just dating at that point in time uh, for her and I to basically find a place to camp for the night. And eventually at about three in the morning after spending the day hiking out in Jasper, I had had enough. I was starting to fall asleep and I figured, you know what? Screw it. We'll pull over on the side of the road. It's safer. Have a little camping gear, set our tent up about, you know, shit, 30 meters off the side of the road. Um, in the morning, we were woken up by a very, very nice conservation officer, mm -hmm. um, you know, informed that we weren't allowed to do it. I pled my case. Um, another great example of ignorance um, doesn't help you in these situations. Yeah. Um, I knew we shouldn't have been camping there. It was, you know, keep pushing, potentially fall asleep at the wheel or just pull over and sleep. And because of how tight the roadways are, I figured sleeping in the truck would not be a great idea because shoulders aren't huge. Yeah. And, you know, this way at least we'd be safer. Yeah. So, um, you know, once again, long list of charges uh, and fines were levied against us. There was camping in National Park without proper permitting. Um, because the passenger side tires of my truck left the gravel shoulder and hit part of the fauna, um, I was nailed with off-roading charges, oh. plus uh, site remediation photos were taken. and. Charges for that were submitted as well um, because I had a portable little fire pit with me that was up off the ground and there were noticeable signs that we had been using that. Um, we also got hit with having a open fire outside of a prescribed area. Oh my God, they hosed you. Oh yeah. So, you know, the officer, you know, as he's explaining everything and I mean like very much one of those, it's like, yeah, you know, I knew about the camping. I didn't figure anything about the others and he figured you know at the end of everything he's like well you know he's like only get you for the camping and you know call it good so oh he, thank god i thought you meant he issued a ticket for every single one of those oh it gets better so because it's a federal offense at this point because it's a federal park i've got to show up for a court date it's not just fines yeah i show up uh at this point uh we myself and my partner because we're like oh we're going up to the mountains again anyway for it might as well make a trip of it we uh rented an airbnb this time you know just yeah. play it safe and uh i show up for my appearance and next thing you know it's they start reading out the list of charges emphasis on the charge is um so although i was told i was only going to get a charge for the camping there was one for off-roading, having the fire, camping, things. So I ended up getting hit with three charges, um, all of which when I went to speak with the Crown about, they went, well, ignorance isn't an excuse. Oh, and, uh, you know, you did what you did. If you uh, didn't know, you should have read, you know, the rules and regulations before you went into the park. And uh, so we're not even going to attempt to plea or, you know, bargain with you on this one. Oh, boy. So I went up figuring that, you know, yeah, OK, if I talk with the judge, I will, you know, plead my case, explain that. Yeah, I uh, knew what I did. And, you know, it was uh, explain my situation. Maybe things might work out in my favor. 
And um, they did in some regards. I still ended up getting hit with, I think it was almost $3,200 worth of fines. <laughs> oh. um, but because of the photos, uh, the judge ruled um, for the off-roading charge that was a $1,000 fine. And, but there would be no remediation or anything else needed, so they wouldn't have to worry about sending out uh, surveyors, estimators, earthworks crews. So yeah. that saved me potentially tens of thousands of dollars. Oh. Um, the other, the camping one, I forget what that was. It wasn't as outrageous as I had expected for the fine. Yeah. The having a campfire out of a designated zone, that one, um, the judge had zero sympathy with me for. And I think that one on its own was, I think, almost an $1,800 fine. And uh, there uh, was uh, apparently uh, with that one infraction, I could have, uh, if they had decided to pursue it, they could have barred me from federal parks for up to life if they chose. Oh. So that means like with me traveling through to BC to get that way, well, guess what? The highways that pass through those federal parks, I wouldn't be allowed to take anymore. And I mean, I don't know if that is true, but that was the notion that uh, I was given from it. Okay. So I was uh, fairly happy with the you know, fines I got and yeah. to uh, just know better not to, you know, uh, how do I put this poetically? Uh, don't fuck around if you don't want to find out. Uh, I, I feel like another part of the reason why I'm torn is because as someone that worked as a park ranger for a while, it can be so hard to catch people in the act that when you do, it's almost like, well, I need to lay charges here because probably another dozen people got away with it at some point today. Yeah. And I completely understand that. And then when you hammer them with the charges, the stories get out and then other people are a lot more careful. That being said, I wonder if there is any way to paddle that Northwest passage without breaking rules. Because I would, I would imagine the firearm was probably for polar bears. Likely. I, I mean, either that or... Because I don't know the entire logistics of that route, but I, I, it's, I know you're going fairly far north with it. And, yeah. and I mean, you get big black bears. You get that remote. You've got your bears. Doesn't matter your type. You've got wolves. You've got cougars. You've got to worry about. Yeah. About like, uh, I mean, hell, even at that point, like, you get a bull moose pissed off, or you get near a cow moose with a calf. I mean, like, I'm sure you've probably seen the one video that went around. And it's kind of making its way around again this year, but it was really popular last year. Um, some guy on a ski do saw a moose, went up to, you know, oh, try to get close to it. And the moose decided once he got within like yeah. a meter, or he didn't want any of it. And the moose, moose just starts like attacking him and it's like hoof dropping him and everything else. And like visibly breaks the guy's leg and, uh. and you know, like his buddies were on sleds or, you know, like revving their engine, screaming at it, trying to get the moose to bugger off. And, uh, yeah, yeah it, it doesn't. And then the video cuts out and you like, uh, the little story blurb, like, yeah, um, multiple fractures, you know, some pretty severe lacerations from it. And, you know, like this is like, you know, what can be expected when you head out? And I mean, like, I get proper preparation. I mean, like, hell, when I'm out in the, you know, middle of nowhere out in the Peace River County elk hunting mm -hmm. and, you know, it's like, yeah, I've got a firearm with me. I've got a lot of extra gear I carry with me just in case. Like we were just talking this morning about how like to go out for a day planning on heading back to, you know, base camp and that, you know, evening, um, my pack was prepped for me to basically spend up to four nights out in, you know, minus 30 degree weather 
prepared just for it. So I mean, like yeah. I understand the precautionary side of it, but you have to also weigh that against the legality side of it mm. somewhere. Yeah, I, I remember on one of my earlier episodes, I also talked about that story where the two guys got in trouble for their like national park survival challenge video. Do you remember reading that headline? Yes, uh, where they were. Well, it was like a fish catch and cook, and it, also they were building a couple structures in the park. It was it was just after what is it the Alone series or whatever aired, yeah. and there were yeah a couple guys. Uh, I think it was, one was Alberta, and there were a couple from the states who came out this way. Zach Fowler and Greg Ovens, I think, were the two names because the one guy has a YouTube channel, which. Again, credit where credit is due, Fowler's Makery and Mischief is actually a pretty fun survival outdoor channel. Yeah. He makes good videos. It's just, again, he he thought, I, I don't know exactly what he thought, but I think he was, you know what, I, I don't want to put myself into his head and try and say what he was thinking, but yeah. basically he was doing the survival challenge kind of right at the edge of the park boundary. Some of what he did was on provincial land. Some of it was in the provincial or the federal park land. Yeah. Uh, maybe he misread a map. Maybe he yeah. didn't. Re maybe he was going on outdated regs. Who knows? Yeah, because all I know with that one is uh, they did use some of the videos that he had posted from his YouTube channel mm -hmm. as, uh, you know, I don't want affirmation, damnation videos, we'll call it, in his court case. Um, but there was that as well as some of the fish that he had caught and had video of him, you know, cleaning, cooking. Um, they were on the like no catch list. I'm not, I can't remember if they were. I think it was eight. Cuddy's. Yeah. Cutthroat trout. So, and I mean like anybody who does a lot of fishing in Alberta knows that our cutthroat trout are typically something that, you know, they're fun to catch. Yeah. Um, do release. Uh, we have a fair number of species here that it's, uh, there's zero retention. Sturgeon, bull trout. Cutties. Cutties. Yeah. I don't, you can keep cutties in some areas, can't you? I, I, th I thought like in Southern Alberta, I thought in the, I, I don't want to say the spa now, I don't want to blow it up, but I feel like, I feel like there are some places in the foothills where you're allowed one. Maybe. I know a lot of the actual like, tributaries and actual river fishing, you're not allowed to keep much out of that. It could be like walleye where it's a zero limit in a lot of places, but occasionally you can keep them yeah, or pay for your walleye. special handling license. Yeah. Yeah. Cash grab. <laughs> Also, also, I saw this interesting map that I'm going to put on the screen, actually. It was the Edmonton Ecological Zones map. Have you ever heard of the Edmonton Master Naturalist Program? Master Naturalist Program, eh? No, I haven't. So I don't know if it, I don't believe it is still active, but they made this really good map of Edmonton and it showed, uh, where is the map now? They made a really good map of Edmonton, which showed its uh, different zones. And let me see if I can pull it up. They divided Edmonton into eight main zones. Here we go. I'll share this one on the video, but broke it up into like rough eco regions, Big Lake, Horse Hills Creek, Upper Central, Lower North Saskatchewan River Valley, White Mud, Black Mud Creek, Mill Creek, and Southeast Edmonton Moraine. I have hiked through all of those areas, and it is interesting how different some of them feel. Like when you're in White Mud and Black Mud Creek, it doesn't feel like you're in Edmonton. When you're in Horse Hills, you're practically not in Edmonton. You're outside the Henday. It's all just yeah. farmland and ravine up there. No, I can definitely uh, agree with you on that. I know going through, I've hiked trails mostly along the North Saskatchewan pretty much all through Edmonton. And there are definitely some spots where if it wasn't for the fact that you could glimpse the city through the trees or, you know, the odd little suburb up on the cliff's edge, you definitely wouldn't think you're there. Um, I've also found a lot of wildlife in there. Found mm -hmm. a, a couple interesting uh, old, you know, municipal abandoned buildings along in there. Um, some of them are... Well, we just won't talk about that because we're not supposed to be going in there. <laughs> so. 
normalize urban exploration. <laughs> Very much so. Um, if you get out, I mean, you don't have to go on crazy huge adventures to see some pretty neat stuff. I know uh, even during the summer, I mean, uh, floating the North Saskatchewan and stuff like that is a lot of fun. I've known quite a few people, especially when I was living in the fort, where I'd get a phone call in the early morning asking if I would be home in the evening, and you're like, yeah, cool, why? And they're like, can you pick us up? And you're like, where the, where the fuck from? Like, why am I picking you up? And they're like, oh, we're going to float by your place. And you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> that would so, be fun. Yeah. That would be nice. I... Ideal dream scenario. I either my investments take off crazily or I win a large sum of money and just buy a nice place right on the edge of the North Saskatchewan River with decent river access. That would be that would be ideal. Yeah, I think uh, uh, yeah. Good luck with that. And I, 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 yeah. Everyone can win at least one lottery, right? That's what the lottery's known for. Generosity. <laughs> I'm going to keep my smart ass comments moving, to myself moving on from my broken dreams <laughs> no ice means no ice fishing warm winter hurts southern Ontario anglers and businesses typically mid-January marks the beginning of safe ice season in southern Ontario but on seasonably warm temperatures have people worried if there will be any ice at all Marty Drager of Grumpy Baits a fishing lure manufacturer based in Waterloo, Ontario said that anywhere from 30 to 40% of his business is reliant on the winter season for ice fishing. Many local businesses near heavily fished areas are also losing a big part of their revenue. So think of the gas stations and Tim Hortons and other small businesses and coffee shops that are on the edge of the lakes. Because um, a gas station and a Tim Hortons is a small business. Some of them are, I mean, like if they're franchises, if they're independently owned, I know they're, I, I, I know I, they're multinational chains, but like even just think of like the mom and shop, bait and tackle shops, I know. anyone that's like selling <laughs> pies right beside a nice lake. It's, yeah. uh, yeah, it's not looking great. Yeah, um, no. Professor Robert McClellan, who's an environmental studies professor at Wilfrid Laurier University said ice, bl uh, ice anglers can blame El Nino for atypical warmth saying essentially our start date for winter is being pushed back, but also winter is just generally becoming shorter and milder because of climate change. So super interesting thing that I was reading the other day about El Nino's. Um, it all has to do with a lot of the coastal water temperatures. I believe it was in South Africa uh, from the currents that they've got out there where um, if the current warm water currents get pushed further South, I guess it would be, I think it was. They were saying that it's not so much that winter is delayed, if things just, our colder climate just tends to get pushed further north. So it's just kind of a shift through everything. Now, I might be horribly paraphrasing that because <laughs> I read that a couple days ago. Um, and I thought that was really neat, but like to touch base on that, like uh, I work in Northern Alberta mm -hmm. and since about October, we've had snow out there. Um, like we've had mild, milder weather, um, but it's typically been below zero since then up at work. It, so um, it hasn't been like Edmonton where we've had like multiple plus no. seven, plus eight days in December. Um, like we do have, we have had them occasionally while I'm up there now, granted I'm on a, two week on, two week off cycle. Yeah. So I can't speak to the time I'm down here, but um, every time I've gone up, there's been about, like we've got over, I'd say when I left three weeks ago, cause I took some time off for Christmas. Um, we had about 18 inches of snow on the ground and that's been fairly consistent. Like I said, since like end of October, beginning of November. Yeah. Um, We've had multiple stretches where we're seeing like minus 20 degrees and stuff like that for a week or plus more straight. And then, you know, the temperature will come up where we're hovering around the zero mark again. So that was really interesting reading about that and hearing about the shift. Cause I mean, from Edmonton to where I work, it's about 500 
50 kilometer as bird flies north of here. So that's interesting. But I mean, at the same time, would I consider that mild for this time of the year up there? Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, we're used to in the dead of winter, I mean, sustained minus 40 degree or colder, like just ambient temperature. And then you can throw your wind chill on top of that. So <sighs> took a, yeah, it took a while for the proper cold snap to finally hit the Edmonton area. We're getting down to minus 30 soon. Very soon. I think in a couple days. In a couple days. I'll believe it when I see it this year. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's currently what? Minus 14 out? Eh, minus, well, minus 16. Plus wind. Plus snow. Today's, uh, it's not going to be nice on the ice today. <laughs> Well, that's why we have uh, insulated tents with uh, heaters, right? Yeah. Yeah, because, uh, you know, we're not slumming it anymore. We're glamping now. Yeah. To finish things off, the 2023 wildfire season in Alberta set a record for the most area burned in the province at 2.2 million hectares. Yay! We're winning. Yeah, yeah. Um, once again, we were talking about this, and I believe last year set records as well. Um, the interesting thing to note uh, that Gareth brought up too was the total number of fires didn't yeah. really increase for the extra amount that you know we smashed our previous high score of. Yeah, it was a totally average number of fires. It's just the amount of area burned was so much higher than it had been in the past. Yeah. And I mean, I think once again, we can attest that to just a very dry year. I mean, uh, last year we had, or I had my uh, parents come up to visit in the spring and normally we're notorious for, you know, mid spring through late spring, you know, where it starts getting really warm. We have our, you know, incredible evening thunder and lightning and torrential downpours of rain and we didn't get a whole lot of it. I mean, uh, there was something of note that I found, and I know for the last couple of years now, it hasn't seemed like we've been really getting that either. No, like I distinctly recall a couple of good thunderstorms in 2020. Yeah. But I, and like obviously like memory is faulty, but I don't remember any other really memorable ones since 2020. Yeah. Whereas, like, I remember prior to 2020, like, when I was still living in Fort Saskatchewan, it's, like, there were, when I was renting from a friend out there, there were, shit, when I was home, half the evenings, things were, like, we would just hang out in his garage with the garage doors open, and, you know, you'd just be listening to the storm, watching, you know, the lightning show going on, yeah. uh, and then it's, like, you I haven't seen that in a while. I wouldn't say I'm a light sleeper, but I remember back when I lived with my parents, I slept in the basement and the storm was so loud, it it woke me up. It sounded like the whole house was going through like a car wash. It was it was that loud. The rain was coming like almost sideways at the house. Yeah. Um yeah, it's been a while since I've had one like that. And you know what? Now that I'm saying it out loud, it's probably going to hit me when I'm camping. <laughs> when I'm like a two day walk from my truck. <laughs> so oh, gonna... you mean like when I was out by Ram Falls this summer and I was like, man, it is so beautiful out. I hike like two and a half kilometers out and down into the fucking valley. You know, only to, you know, get the fly rod set up, get a couple casts out drift, and you look up and you're like, well, those clouds don't look nice. <laughs> and get a couple more cat, but you're like, oh, the wind's blowing them, you know, away from you. Get a couple more casts, in, and the wind hasn't changed directions, but those storm clouds are rolling in towards you, and you're like, I've seen this when I've been out on my boat in the water. Start packing up the fly rod, start hiking out, and I get just to the top of the valley, and fucking like marble sized hail just starts coming down, and I was. So thankful I brought my backpack with me and I basically wore it as a helmet uh, for the like two kilometer jog back to the camper. And that was the one that ended up fucking up the roof on the yeah. on the camper that trip. So yeah, you could have gotten concussed if you weren't careful. Uh, you said baseball size tail? No, no. 
uh, marble size. Well, okay, I was like, baseball size tail, you're getting concussed. <laughs> yeah, no, that that would, yeah, that would maim you some of the fears. Yeah. So in, in total, 48 communities and 38,000 people had to be evacuated in Alberta. Uh, Drayton Valley and Edson were the two big evacs in province. And then we had the Yellowknife evac as well for Northwest Territories. And all of them came down to Edmonton as well because we were the closest municipality, the closest major municipality that was able to help them all out. Um, and it was even a bad year for all of Canada with 18.5 million hectares burned and four firefighters killed on the job. So yeah, I didn't hear about that. You, you didn't hear about the firefighters killed on the job? No. The, that was for Canada wide though. So oh, okay. the, the news might not have made it to us, but it's been a rough year. So obviously thanks to all the wildfire fighters and other people that helped out during that, yeah. because I hope you have a good winter because with our lack of moisture, it's probably going to happen again next year. Yeah. I'm more, I'm worried. I'm worried. We just have to make sure that, you know, people stay out of evac zones, not try to, crawl into you know an area to go get some fishing in it would be terrible if someone accidentally went down a back road that they thought was a shortcut which was just a winter road that somebody cut some locks on and took some signs off of. yeah yep yeah i uh so someone we know may have done that <laughs> it's uh <laughs> shall not be disclosed <laughs> But the that, good news is they got out safely. Uh, it was a great learning moment for some uh, about, you know, equipment to take with you, gear that yeah. they had on them. And if anybody gets their vehicle stuck around the Grand Cash area, I believe the tow truck driver was named Marco. Um, Marco is a local legend around Grand Cash. So uh, give him a call. He can get you out of anything. <laughs> That's uh well that's pretty much all we've got today. Thanks for listening folks.